smoothly. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Joe Dittmar to Dias, to SDU, to Denmark today. We have reached a point in our history where those of you conducting your undergraduate or even your master's courses may not have a conscious memory or may not have been born during the events of 9-11. It is shocking to think that it's 20 years ago this week. And so Joe's eyewitness account of the sights, the sounds, the scenes from inside and outside of the World Trade Center complex on 9-11 present an intriguing and gripping perspective of what really happened before and after these terrorist attacks. This was truly a day that changed the world and changed Denmark forever. In the wars that followed, Denmark being a close ally of the United States sent a comparatively high number of troops to Afghanistan in very risky situations. Therefore, Denmark has also had a high number of fatalities per capita, maybe the highest compared to all Western nations involved in the conflict. So the events around 9-11 affect all of us, whether we know it or not. Please feel free to follow and tweet at Danish IAS on Twitter. And thank you to the DS team for their help in organizing this event. Thank you also to Professor Caroline Kennedy-Pipe and Professor Sten Bruning for agreeing to talk to us after this event about the war in Afghanistan. But it is with this that I hand over to Joe Dittmar, who joins us live from the United States. Joe, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very, very much for this opportunity, James. It's, uh, it's great to be there with you and everybody. Um, it's an amazing world that we live in that uh, we can be communicating from literally sea to shining sea. And uh, it is so nice to be able to uh, be here 20 years later to discuss this with you. Um, I don't know how much of the world news uh, transmits around the world, but last week um, here in the States, we witnessed once more the elements of surprise and suffering as a result of uh, an event that was totally unexpected, unanticipated. 51 people in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut made simple decisions to stay in their homes, to drive to work or to drive to a supermarket, never knowing that the incredible rainstorms and powerful floodwaters of what had been Hurricane Ida would take their lives in that very moment. Just a simple decision such as that. You know, when you're in the midst of a decision-making process where, uh, you know, we, we, we don't know how things can be affected, decisions, that you make day to day, make up your character, make up who you are. You make big decisions, you make simple decisions, and the information that you have, the resource that you have uh, to make those decisions uh, is important as well. Uh, they can be for better or for worse. When you're in the midst of a critical decision-making process, we're often thrust into the role of leader, and sometimes we're not even sure how we got there. And now the decisions that you make are not only affecting you, but they're affecting your decisions that could be life and death to others. It's one thing to have that resource and data that I mentioned uh, in making your decisions, but many times you don't have that resource, you don't have that data, you don't have that background. You can't make the decision with anything else but your gut feel, and you cannot go with any flow because there is no flow to go with. Why am I talking about decision-making processes? Well, I think that that is a lesson that has been learned from my experience in 9-11. I was on the 105th floor of Two World Trade Center, uh, the South Tower, when the events of that fateful day began. And my being here today to speak to you is a testament to critical decisions made by many of us in the most dire of situations. So I think it's important that I get the chance to share with you my memories of that day. I'm in the insurance business, have been in the insurance business for 44 years. 
going to the World Trade Center for a meeting was not unusual. No matter where you lived or worked in the United States, going to the trade centers was normal. It was a mecca for the insurance industry, maybe uh, you know, for companies here in the States and maybe throughout the entire world. And in August of 2001, Mary Weeman, a powerful executive for the Aon Corporation, a woman who had smashed through the glass ceilings that still exist in lots of businesses today, and we try to make that not exist anymore. Uh, Mary called me, asked me to attend a meeting in New York at the Trade Center the following month. I was working at the time for CNA Insurance Company in Chicago, Illinois. When Mary asked me to this meeting, I had a chance to be going to another meeting at the same point in time. Uh, the type of insurance meeting that involved aluminum or titanium sticks about this long, little metal heads on the end, little white balls in the grass. Golfing, I had the chance to go golfing on a business boondoggle. And I kind of wanted to avoid going to her meeting. But Mary in that phone call in August did to me what every woman in my life has been doing to me since the day I was born good old fashioned Catholic guilt, okay? Sure, Joe, no problem, I understand. Nobody from your company will be there. Uh, you know, it's okay, you know, I hope you know, I hope you understand it's gonna be a big meeting. And then she paused and she said, hey, do you know the president of your company? And I said, well, of course, Mary, I report to the president of my company, why do you ask? And she said, well, I'm having a meeting with him next week. I'll let him know that you can't make my meeting. And I said, ah, I see how this works. All right. So I made the plan to make sure I could attend her meeting and still do the other things that I wanted to do. On the Friday before the Tuesday, 9-11 was on a Tuesday. Uh, on that Friday, I flew back from Chicago to Philadelphia. Uh, to visit with my mother and father in the house that I grew up in as a kid. On Saturday, I visited with my sister. On Sunday, I had the chance to go to a football game with my son. On Monday, I had that golf outing that I was talking about and had a great fun lunch uh, after that outing and a real business meeting on Monday afternoon. Uh, they wanted to have a business dinner on Monday night but insurance business dinners can last forever. And I had a plan. If you've ever been to New York, if you know anybody from New York, one thing that you would understand is that you never want to drive into New York City. The traffic is just incredibly bad. So I'm in South Jersey, South New Jersey. I've got to go 80 miles to get to New York City for this meeting. And I decided I wasn't going to drive. I would take a train. So I drove back from where I was to Philadelphia and got on an Amtrak train and took that train and was to New York City. Um, I got to Philadelphia at 6 a.m. in the morning and got on a train. Bought my round trip ticket, went down, got on the train, sat down in my seat, took off my backpack, took off my suit coat. Um, sat down, turned my laptop on, and did what all of us insurance guys do at 6 a.m. on the morning train to New York City. I, I fell asleep. It was 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, and off we went. And I was about two-thirds of the way up to New York City when my cell phone rang. For those of you that are younger, don't laugh. Yes, there was cell service. There were cell phones in 2001, okay? A uh, little bit different. Uh, phones weren't as smart as they are now, but we all had some type of cellular device. And, you know, cellular devices, cell phones have changed the way all of us live our lives. Back in the day before cellular service, and if you were going on a business trip like the one I'm describing, you had to have a plan and it had to be on a piece of paper and it was an itinerary and it told you where you were going to be, what meetings you were going to be at, what hotel you would be staying at, your assigned hotel room number, the phone number for the hotel so that people could call you because God forbid you had to use the phone to make long distance phone calls because it was very expensive to do that 
this was the way life was. With cell phones, now, wherever you are, that's where you'll be. And if anybody needs to contact you, if you need to contact someone else, all you need to do is hit them up on the cell phone. That's it. And it wasn't a whole lot different in 2001. When I was getting ready to leave on this trip, I said to my wife, hey, you know, I'm going back to Philly for the weekend, visiting with family. I'm going to uh, be in New York on Tuesday, have a meeting Tuesday morning. I'll be home Tuesday night. Love you. That's basically all I told her. Didn't have to tell her too much more because if she needed me, she knew how to get me. So I'm telling you all this because I'm on that train to New York City on Tuesday morning and I'm fast asleep and my cell phone rings and I pick it up and it's my wife who immediately apologizes because she can tell from my groggy voice that she's woken me up. And I said to her, no, 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 I'm, I'm glad you woke me up. The train's about to pull into Newark, New Jersey and uh, I have to get off. And she kind of paused a second and said, wait a minute, I thought you said you were going to New York. And I said, yes, yes, I am. I, I, but it's a lot easier to get to the World Trade Center if you take the PATH commuter train from Newark right into New York because it stops right at the Trade Center. That morning, I told my wife exactly where I was going to be. Made my way onto that PATH train with thousands of other New Jerseyans and made my way into New York City. Upon arrival at to World Trade Center, one of the things that amazed me immediately were the security people. I could not believe how good these people were at identifying who belonged and who didn't belong in the building simply by looking at your face. And I am, I'm sure that the bombing in 1993 at the World Trade Center was reason for that security team being so good. I walked into the building, the security guy looked at me, just waved me over with his little finger waving, and I had to ID myself with my driver's license. He took my picture electronically. He transferred that picture onto a card that also has my name, uh, the floor that I was visiting, 105, um, the company that I was visiting, Aon Corporation, uh, the validity date, the card was valid until 9-12-2001, and a barcode. The barcode was the most important thing on that card because that's how I would swipe my way through the electronic turnstiles that separated us from the elevator banks in the building. Both buildings were identical. Both buildings were 100 and 10 stories high. Um, both buildings at any particular point in time had as many as 25,000 people in them each. This was its own community. So when you would go through the turnstiles, you had to take a choice of three banks of elevators that serviced differing floors. I had to take an, a bank of elevators that went up to the 78th floor known as the Sky Lobby, and that's what this was, a second lobby in the building because they couldn't engineer elevators to go straight up 110 flights. So you had to take a, uh, a bank of elevators that took you to 78 where you transferred onto another set of elevators, and then you would take that up to wherever you were going up through 110. Um, 110 in the North Tower was the Windows of the World restaurant. And unfortunately, that restaurant was open that morning at this time. 110 and 107 in the building that I was in, the South Tower, were observation decks. Very fortunately, they were not open at this time. The other floors that I didn't mention above 105 in both buildings were heating, ventilation, air conditioning, elevator equipment, elevator cabling, no human beings. We were going up to 105 the highest occupied level of the South Tower at that time. When we got to the 105th floor, Mary Weeman, the woman that I mentioned earlier, just happened to be by the elevator doors and she was able to greet us with a warm hello 
and also an interesting sight. She had a spray bottle of wax in one hand and a rag in the other hand. <laughs> this woman was not Susie Homemaker by any stretch of the imagination. She was all business. But this was how important this meeting that was about to commence was to her. She was wanting everything to be perfect, right down to the furniture and the enclosed conference room that she had just finished polishing. She escorted us to that internal conference room. And it was an internal meaning that it was inside the floor, four walls, no windows, one door. The meeting was supposed to commence at 8.30. And I've been in the insurance business for 44 years and there's never been an insurance meeting that's ever started on time. And this day was no different. 8.30 kind of came and went, everybody standing around drinking coffee, talking about anything but insurance. And at 8.46, the lights flickered. That's it. We couldn't feel anything. We couldn't see anything. We didn't hear anything. Just this flicker of the lights. Almost immediately, a gentleman from the Aon Corporation by the name of Rick Blood came bounding into the room. He said, hey, there's been an explosion in the North Tower. We have to evacuate. And there are 54 of us in this room at this point. And we all looked back at Rick and did the same exact thing. We kind of waved our hands at him and we said, Rick, it's New York. Stuff is always going on here in New York. Don't worry about it. We'll be fine. Let us have our meeting. We'll be good. And he shook his head a little bit and he said, no, you don't understand. I am a volunteer fire marshal. I have to clear 105, 104, 103 before I leave. And trust me, I want to leave. And I know Rick got everybody out of that room that day because I was the last guy out. He escorted us all to the nearest fire stairwell on 105. And that's where he proceeded to tell us all that we were now going to walk down 105 flights of steps. Not too many happy people at that particular point in time. Everybody was really kind of perturbed. I mean, we all did the same thing. We all grabbed our cell phones and we tried to see if we could communicate. The main cell tower for all of Southern Manhattan was on top of the North Tower. So when we flipped up our flip phones, if you still have a flip phone, shame on you, okay? But we all flipped up our flip phones and we're looking at our screens and the screens say no service. That cell tower was gone. And then if you think, okay, get on a regular phone, a landline phone, good idea, except the problem was that everybody in New York are now on those landlines trying to call their spouse, their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister, whomever, to try to find out if they're okay. And even more incredibly, everybody in the world, and you know this is not a stretch, everybody in the world that knows somebody in New York City are now calling in on those same landlines, trying to find out whether their family, friends, whomever were okay. So the cell phones and the landlines were gone. Landlines couldn't handle the communication traffic, cell service interrupted. And whether it was intentional or not, the terrorists accomplished something that every military person will tell you is the first act you perform when you attack. And that is to cut the lines of communications. And that's exactly what they did that morning. Again, whether it was intentional or not, that's exactly what they did. So back on 105 with the 54 type A personalities being told that they have to walk down 105 flights of steps and not being able to communicate, we were pretty much just pissed off. And I'm sure you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, my God, didn't you understand what was going on? And that's exactly the point. All your parents, all the teachers that you have, all the people that were around on that day were doing the same thing. They were watching TV and the news and understanding way more what was going on outside and inside those buildings than any of us that were right there. We had no clue. We didn't have a clue. And we began to make our way down the steps. When we got to the 90th floor, 
in the fire stairwell. The door from the 90th floor out onto the 90th floor itself was propped open and it should ha not have been. Those doors should all be closed. When you get in a fire stairwell, you're supposed to go all the way down to the lobby level. There are signs inside those fire stairwells that tell you exactly that. But for some reason, the door at 90 was propped open and everybody in our fire stairwell is getting out of the fire stairwell. Now I'm in the fire insurance business, how ironic. And I know better, right? I followed everybody out onto the 90th floor. I didn't know the building. I didn't know whether I needed to get to another fire stairwell. What I can tell you is that's where I experienced the worst 30, 40 seconds of my life. You look out the windows to the north and you see these gaping black holes through the sides of the building, gray, and black billows of smoke pouring out of those holes, flames redder than any red I had ever seen, licking up the sides of the building. It was a crystal clear day that day in New York City, beautiful skies. And I remember as I'm standing there looking through that smoke, through that fire and into those huge black holes, I'm seeing pieces of the fuselage of a large plane lodge inside that building. And I kept thinking to myself, my God, how did the pilot not see that building? How did he miss? And he didn't miss. He didn't miss. And you see all of this and you see because of the force of the plane through that building causing this vacuum effect and it's pulling out furniture and paper and people. Gruesome gruesome, gruesome sight. And I was so afraid, so afraid. I just wanted to go home. I, I, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go home. And I looked to turn around and leave. And there were people on that floor who seemed to be frozen, whether frozen in fear or mesmerized by what they saw screaming at the top of their lungs and, and yet not seemingly able to move. I needed to go. When I got to the top of the fire stairwell on 90 to proceed down, they started making an announcement over the PA system in the building. And the announcement said something to the effect of, the event has been contained to the North Tower. We believe the South Tower is safe. We suggest that if you work in the South Tower, you return to your workstation. If you feel, if you're a visitor, we suggest that you stay where you are until further notice. And if you feel you need to leave, please proceed with caution. I'm sure people think to themselves, how could they make that announcement? How could they do this? But I, I, I actually, it made some logical sense. There's a woman or man at this point in this event who's in charge of building security into World Trade Center. They're down at the lobby level. There's a firefighter on one side. There's a police person on the other side. They're looking back at this person in charge of building security. And they're saying to them, you've got 25,000 people in this building. You can't let them out of the building because it's raining concrete and steel and bodies. You can't let them out. What are you going to do? And I'm sure this person thought, well, wait a minute, our electricity was working, our elevators were going up and down, our ventilation system was working, just, just wait, let's see what's happening before we do anything dramatic. Who would have ever thought that within 18 minutes, the same exact thing would happen to our building? Who would have thought? I was proceeding. I didn't know how cautious I was going to be. I was getting out. I got down to that 78th floor, that sky lobby level that I mentioned. And there was Mary, once again, she's out in front of me and she's screaming back at me in no uncertain terms, how come to the elevator. I'm not walking down 78 flights of steps in these shoes. And she was using a word you never use in Denmark. Okay. And, and she was just adamant about me coming to the elevators with her. But finally, my pea brain took over a little bit and some common sense. I kept thinking to myself, building 
state of duress, fire, emergency. Yeah, I know it's not my building, but no elevator. I shouldn't go in the elevator. I never said a word to Mary. I just looked over her politely, waved to her, turned around and went back to the fire stairwell. Arguably the best decision I've made in what is still my life because I was somewhere between the 72nd and 74th floor in the fire stairwell when the second plane plowed through our building. And that plane went through our building between floors 77 and 83. We were just a few short stories below the strike zone. I've never felt anything like that. Never ever wanna feel anything like that again. We are in this fire stairwell, this concrete bunker, and it is shaking so violently back and forth. The concrete spidering out, the handrails breaking away from the wall, the steps like waves in the ocean undulating underneath our feet. And we feel this heat ball blowing by us. We smell this jet fuel and this thing's just rocking back and forth, back and forth. It felt like forever. Maybe it was seconds, maybe a minute and it finally settles. And you would think there would be craziness, pandemonium, wildness, screaming, nothing but a stunned silence. We tried to use the cell phones again to try to see and communicate and find out what was going on. And thank God they weren't allowing us to do that. They weren't working because at that point, ignorance was bliss. What we didn't know couldn't hurt us. We only had to concentrate on one thing, going down, getting out. On the way down, we saw human nature being at its finest. There were people in that stairwell coming out of wheelchairs, on crutches, with canes, overweight, just freaking out, just totally losing it. And people just like you and me, just like you and me, they began to help these people, both physically and emotionally. We became teammates. We coached and coaxed each other to make sure that we could all get down those steps. And things were fine. Everybody was moving in the same direction. Anything that was in our way, we just kicked it out of the way, whether it was bags of food or clothing or women's shoes, tons of women's shoes, because you're walking down 78 flights of steps, you're not gonna wear three or four inch heels. Lots of barefooted women that day. So you just got everything out of your way and everything was pretty copacetic, pretty calm. And we were all going in the same direction until the 35th floor. And um, that's the chance when we had for the first time to encounter the police, the firefighters and the paramedics from New York City and the Port Authority. Hmm. It was one of those moments where just the looks in their eyes told the entire story. No words, just the looks in their eyes. They knew. They knew. They knew that they were going up those steps to try to fight a fire that they could not beat. They knew that they were going up those steps to try to save lives that they couldn't save. They knew that they were going up and they knew that they were never coming back. They knew. And yet they did what they promised, marched up those steps to protect, to serve, to save. I don't know how you can be that brave and strong. I just don't know how you can be that brave and strong. When we got down to the lobby level, we looked out the windows to the left, to the right. It looked like the vestiges of war, crumbled concrete, twisted steel, big red markings on the ground, and you knew what those red markings on the ground were. They couldn't let us out at the street level. They had to take us down into the concourse, the underground, and the underground 
was the first chance we had to see people really affected by the event, missing limbs, gaping wounds, true blood and gut stuff. And that human nature that I mentioned earlier, that takes over and you want to reach out and you want to try and assist in some way. And yet you cannot that day because there were so many first responders there to help people. I have never seen in one place at one time, such an outpouring of caring, of concern, of love. This was what this was, this outpouring of love. So the people that needed help were getting the help they needed. And those of us that were okay, we're on our own. And we're now in this rat maze of corridors known as the World Trade Center Concourse. It's like a gigantic shopping mall. Every fast food and little retail store known to mankind, big train station to go back to New Jersey on that path train, signs that mean absolutely nothing to you if you're not from New York City, and you're kind of lost not knowing where to go, and the herd mentality takes over, and you hope somebody at the front of your little herd knows where they're going. And I hear this young man in front of our little group saying, we want to get to the northeastern end of the complex. It's the furthest away from the two buildings. And my internal GPS said, yeah, he's right. He's right. I'm following him. And we started to make our way to that northeastern end of the complex to get away from the buildings and out and onto ground level. And when I got to that northeastern end of the complex, the escalators that we were now going up were no longer working. So we were marching more steps up at this point to get to the street level. I was very fortunate at that particular point to have bumped into a business associate of mine by the name of David Duffy, who worked in the building, the same building that I was in, the South Tower. And we walked out together. And when we got to the ground level, all the people that were there, all the uniforms that were there were already plowing back concrete, steel, bodies, gruesome sight. And they're screaming at us, run, 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 don't stop, don't stop. And we got across the street in front of St. Paul's Chapel and we couldn't help ourselves. We stopped and we turned around and looked at this incredible scene, this set of two buildings in a complete and total state of duress this ticker tape of concrete and steel and bodies. And David looked at me and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, David, I have no clue. I was supposed to get on a train, go back to Philadelphia, get in a rental car, drive to the Philadelphia airport, get in that plane and fly back to the Chicago area where I lived at that time. And I said, well, I don't think that's going to happen. And he said, I don't think so either. He said, why don't you come with me? I live on the Upper West Side. We'll get to my place together. I haven't been able to communicate with my wife. I want to make sure she's okay. Why don't you come with me? And that sounded like a plan. And that's exactly what we started to do. And we were eight blocks north, eight minutes away from the World Trade Center complex when we came across a commercial laundry whose doors were thrown wide open and the all news radio station in New York was on their radio blaring out that this was an on purpose terrorist attack. A truly American moment for us because we all, our jaws just dropped to the ground, not here. This doesn't happen here. But it was the next couple of sounds that are the sounds that all of us that were there that day hear every day. It's what I hear in the morning. It's what I hear at night. First, the unmistakable sound of the crumbling concrete, the twisting steel of what once was that South Tower that we had been in just eight minutes prior coming to the ground. Even more hauntingly, the sound of hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of New York all screaming the same blood curdling scream at the same time. We were very fortunate. David had a friend of his that lived in that section of New York City, Tribeca, and we were able to get into Meredith's flat. Um, her husband, ironically, 
stuck in Chicago, which is where I wanted to be. And we all did what the rest of the world did at that point. We watched the TV. We tried to understand what was going on, tried to make some sense of this day. We were about five hours, five and a half hours into watching and wondering and waiting when one of the heroes of that day, no matter what his politics are now, no matter what his circumstances are now, one of the true heroes of that day was the mayor of New York City. And at that time, it was Rudy Giuliani. And he got on the TV and he started to talk about the fact that, hey, New York, this has been a tough day. We are going to get through this. We're going to survive. We're going to recover. And I know all of you just want to get home. No truer words were ever spoken. And all means of transportation had been totally locked down since the event. So there was walking or nothing. Everything was locked down. And he repeated himself. He said, I know all of you just want to get home. I believe I mustered enough confidence in our uniforms, in our security, and we are going to reopen the subways. Reopen the subways. A gutsy call. My friend David said, come on, we're going to the subway. And I, I said, David, we, we can't get in a subway. We're going to go through central Manhattan all the way to your place. I said, you know, Empire State Bill. We didn't know what the next target was going to be. But he convinced me and we walked over to the nearest subway station, couldn't even get down the steps. It was so crowded with people. We finally got down and got on about the second or third train that pulled through. We went two stops up and it was Penn Station, Amtrak, the big train station in New York City. We had heard that Amtrak was doing an incredible job bringing empty trains from New Jersey into New York and taking people out of New York. And David understood, I wanted to get out. Even if it was just back to Philadelphia where I started my day, I just wanted to get out. And we, talk, we walked off that subway car together, never said a word to each other and walked into this big train station. Looked like two tourists because we have no idea what we're looking for. A woman from Amtrak, God bless her soul. She's looking at me and she waves her finger at me and in her finest New York accent says, where are you going, honey? <laughs> and I said, I got to get to Philadelphia. And she says, great, there's a train right down here about to take off. And I reached into my pocket to give her my return ticket. And she looked at me and she said, are you kidding, sweetie? We're not collecting tickets today. And I thought, yeah, well, some things never change in New York, right? Um, but you go down on that train and you go through a tunnel underneath the Hudson River and you come up on the Jersey side and look at, back at what once was the greatest skyline in the world, all now relegated to a gray and black cloud. How sad. It's an 80 minute trip from New York City to Philadelphia. The train was packed with people sitting, standing, and yet no words were spoken. There were no words to say. And when I got to Philly, I was able to get into my rental car. I decided I wasn't gonna to try to drive the 14 hours back to Illinois at that point. I would stay with my mom and dad in the house I grew up in, in Northeast Philadelphia. And when I got there, my, my, mom, my mom was waiting for me. All of you, sincerely, always love your mothers. Always love your mothers because there's my mom and she's waiting for me and she comes off the steps and she gives me this big giant hug, pats my head, sobs in my ear, my baby, my baby. I didn't have the heart to remind her that I was the oldest one. <laughs> but my mom did for me at that moment, what she continues to do for me to this day. She helped me and she loved me. And God, that's what I needed at that moment. It's my mother's love got into the house, tried to watch the TV, passed out. About two in the morning, I feel this kick in my side and I rub my eyes, push my glasses back, look up, my father is hovering over me and he says, well, aren't you ever going to go to bed? And I thought, oh my God, I'm 17 again. <laughs> but I did what my dad asked me to do, went upstairs, got a few hours of sleep. 
woke up early the next morning, called the office to let them know that I wasn't going to be in. And it was a good thing because they thought I was dead. I made the 14 hour drive back from Philadelphia to Aurora, Illinois, the Western suburb of Chicago where I lived in about 12 and a half hours. I don't necessarily encourage that, but I just wanted to get home. And this was before all the national plans that we all have on our cell phones now where you can call wherever, whenever. I didn't care. I wanted to be able to talk and be talked to. And I was about 10, 15 minutes away from home. I called my wife for probably what was about the 50th time. I said, we're I'm almost there. And she kind of hesitated for a second. And she said, okay, okay. Um, and I said, what's up? And she said, well, they're going to have mass at Our Lady of Mercy. And I stopped her right at that point in the middle of her sentence. And I said, you know what? It's a good day to go to church. It's a good day. I will meet you there. I pulled down the road where the church was. You would have thought it was Christmas. There was no room at the end. The parking lot fully loaded. I found finally a spot on the street. I don't know whether I was more afraid the day before or the minute I opened up the back doors to that church, seeing these hundreds of pairs of eyes all staring back at me, knowing where I had been. I looked over to the right to the pew where we always sit, we're Roman Catholics, we always sit in the same pew, right? <laughs> there is my wife, a couple of my kids and my friends. My wife, how I got so lucky, I don't know. She is the most wonderful person, but she's not an outgoing demonstrative person like me. She would never be doing what I'm doing today. It's not her style. So that's what made it doubly incredible when I looked over there and saw this non-demonstrative woman jump over the back of the pew, run to the back of the church, give me the greatest hug and a kiss a man could ever want. I knew at that moment, I knew at that moment that I was home. I was home. And so this is how my story goes. And the lessons learned in that story are many and varied and almost impossible to recap. But we started out talking about decision-making. And there are key lessons about decision-making that are very clear from this story. Every decision that is made is important, no matter how big, no matter how small one may seem. A decision, any decision, can have greater effects and results than you may have ever assumed. The source of your information, your data, your understanding that you bring to the decision-making process impacts that process in a big way, for better or for worse. And most importantly, making the right decisions, that's not easy. It is not easy. But if you trust your source, if you trust your data, if you trust your gut, your heart, your mind, your soul, you can make successful critical decisions that can have lasting effects, helping to mold, direct, maybe even save your lives and the lives of others. I don't tell this story to feel better about what only breaks my heart over and over again. I don't do it for fame or notoriety. I don't do it for monetary gain. I have never accepted payment for any of my presentations. I do this because I believe as a person who's been part of a historic event, it is my obligation, it is my duty to tell the story and to give a voice to the 3,000 who lost their voices that day so that they once more can be heard and allow their spirits so senselessly dashed to once more rise, reminding all of us and reminding them that while they may have lost their lives, their lives weren't lost in vain. And while I seek no payment, I do ask each and every one of you for compensation in one way and in one way only. To always remember, to never forget. Thank you. Joe, thank you so much. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you for such a, an honest and, and raw account of what happened that day and for your message of, of hope, humanity and, um, and of home. 
as people prepare their questions for you, and we do have 15 minutes for you to ask some questions to Joe, um, I will pose one. It's said that everyone was American that day. And I remember being sent home from school early and my mum not wanting us to leave the house. She was scared. Everyone was afraid and they didn't know where was going to be targeted next. When is it that you realised that this was a, a truly world changing event, one with a global impact, but also global support? My first and hard and cold realization of that probably came when we were holed up in that apartment in Tribeca, where we started seeing the media and how this was being covered and how truly impactful this was on the world. Um, 82 countries were attacked at the Trade Center that day. 82 countries lost citizens at the World Trade Center that day. This wasn't solely an American event. This was a world event, as you suggest, and it was a total world event. And while we had that unity, and it is popular to say we were all Americans that day, you know what? We were all human beings that day. We didn't know politics. We didn't know color. We didn't know religion. We knew each other. And we knew that all, all of us knew that this was wrong. This was wrong. And we needed to be able to unite around that. And we, believe me, as a country here in the States, we could not have wanted such a great reaction as we got from all the countries around the world, especially Denmark, a great true friend of ours. Um, we're so grateful for that. Thanks, Joe. I'm now gonna open the floor to any questions that we have from our, our students and staff here. And if we have any questions online via our YouTube live stream as well. It's amazing, James, isn't it? That when you ask if there are any questions, everybody kind of sit, stays dumbfounded. And, and, and I understand that because it's very hard to, to, to try to figure out where do you start and what do you ask? Well, um, we, we, we've spoken about this before, Jamie yeah. and I, and um, just, just hearing you recount your story again, um, you know, I, I felt the same feelings of, 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 of raw emotion that did the first time I, I heard your story. And that... That, um, of course, is testament to you um, and, and the story that you tell and the message that you leave with us as, as one, like I say, of being hope and humanity in a period of, of pure darkness. But you're right, it is, it is shocking in so many ways, much as it was on that day 20 years ago um, this week. I, I will ask you uh, one other question uh, and then return to our audience just in case you did want to have any final questions. But um, apart from your mother's love, which is always an important message and to love your mothers, uh, perhaps an even more important message, one that my mother would agree with. What message would you want our students and those listening at home to take away from your experience of that day? What you found out in a very, very abrupt and difficult way was that there are no promises of tomorrow. The old saying of carpe diem, seize the day, becomes so readily right at that particular point in time. You need to be able to live your life in the best way possible. What we can't do, what we shouldn't do, what we can't allow is for those who want to change our lives in terroristic ways, using terroristic fashions to change our lives, we cannot allow them to win, to take over. We have to continue to live our lives in the way that we know we want to live our lives in a, in, in a free and a, a wonderful way. And we have to not pull the blankets up over our heads and try to run away from it, but to challenge it head on, no matter what, no matter what, and to do our best, to live our best lives, to do good things, to be who we are, and move on and move forward and triumph in that fashion. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'll just open the floor again to any additional questions. Yes, uh, over back. Uh, I would like to ask one of the politicians in Denmark who think that, who, who actually argue that in order to have, to live in a free society, 
you have to accept to live in a less free society. Do you understand my question? Or my, do you understand the dilemma? They think that we have to accept that democracy and freedom and rights get encroached upon in order to continuously live free from terrorism. James, it was difficult to hear, so could you kind of paraphrase for me? Yes, was there a specific question? Yeah, so there is a, a, a dilemma um, between us living um, in, in democracies and then having some of our, our, our rights potentially curtailed or our freedoms curtailed in order to fight terrorism. Um, is that a... Um, is that, I think our, our guests would like to know your thoughts on that and perhaps if that is a, a, a worthy dilemma and a, a fair exchange of uh, our freedoms to have. Is that a fair account of what you're asking? Yeah, thank you. That, that's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? And it is. we've, been, we've been struggling with that type of question and those and finding the right type of answers uh, for as long as they've written history. And it is, it's, it, it's impossible. We, we, we felt, this country felt that some sort of a militaristic response was proper. And maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Curtailing some of our freedoms, some of our liberties in order to fight the terrorist was done, absolutely. Hey, listen, I traveled for my job to Europe prior to 9-11 and, and I worked for a German insurance company. And when I went to Munich for the first time, that's the first time I ever saw people in green uniforms with guns walking through the airport. But this was a normalcy there. This was something that they did in order to feel more secure and that we, in essence, had to wind up doing here in the States in order to feel more secure and respond in some way to this terroristic attack. You give up some to get some. You can't have the perfect world. There is no nirvana. And you have to try to find the appropriate balance, whether that be in social life or even in our own personal lives like I have. This, this event, trust me, is a, a shadow that follows me every day. It goes wherever I go. And I have to make concessions to that so that I don't break apart, so that I don't fall apart, so that I can be what I need to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a continuous battle that you try to make a moralistic and ethical set of decisions on. It's not easy. It's not right. And there are no right answers. And the one thing that this can't afford to be is political because this was not political to me or 3,000 people that lost their lives or numerous families that lost loved ones, not political at all, it was extremely personal. I don't know if that answers your question 100%, but it gives you the concept of how I feel. No, Joe, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, at the back left. So everyone was human and everyone was American uh, that day, Joe, um, and united around the cause. But in the, the months, the weeks, the, the years that followed, did you find that that unity remained, that humanity remained, or did you find that there was an increasing division within American society or perhaps other nations' perceptions of America? If you've watched any American media in the last four years, <laughs> you know that division and divisiveness has been uh, a popular thing, and um, we're still trying to overcome that. But again, as I would like to point out, this is because of political reasons, okay? And if you take politics aside, and I can tell you this from my firsthand experience, I, have, I do 50 to 60 presentations a year when there's no COVID. And I go across the country and see different people and talk to different people, and whether they're left or right, black or white, red or blue, Democrat or Republican, Jew or Christian, they're all the same thing when it comes to this day. And they're all the same thing. And that is united in a front to fight 
that which is ultimately wrong. And they don't forget, they put it in the compartments of their mind somewhere. And when somebody like myself brings it up, it all comes flooding back to them and they all remember and they all do remember that unity that you're talking about. This is part of my goal. This is part of my goal. I'm only one man, I can only do so much but I will do it with every breath I have until the day I die. And that is to make sure that we try to find that unity and bring that unity to all, not just here, but throughout the globe. And James is being a great friend to allow me uh, to, to try to do that in some fashion on the other side of the Atlantic. No, thank you, Joe. Do we have any final questions? In which case, then, I will bring this part of our event to a close. And I'll ask you to join me again in thanking Joe Dittmar for his time and for recounting his personal experience of 9-11. Thank you, Joe. James, I'm going to leave you. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Joe. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. That seamlessly brings it back to the back of my head. I'm a, no, yes, perfect, yes, there we are, good, all right. Great, okay. So I thought that seeing as we're not only at the 20th anniversary of 9-11, but we're also at, and quickly approaching, 20 years since the war in Afghanistan. Because of course, after those seismic events of 9-11 that we've just heard about, it was on October 7th, 2001, that the war in Afghanistan started, a, a day that has shaped my entire research agenda and life uh, from that point onwards. It was also the day of the first drone strike um, that the US had, had ever conducted with a predator drone, um, an armed drone, against the head of the Taliban, Mullah Omar. And of course, 20 years on from this point, or almost 20 years on, we can see that that conflict in Afghanistan, although the United States and Western forces have um, withdrawn uh, in many aspects, the conflict, of course, still rages on in a, uh, in a civil war capacity. And so I thought it would be um, a poignant and perfect time for us to reflect on both Joe's statements and the 20th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan and the withdrawal that has just happened by having two of the world's leading experts on the war in Afghanistan to come and talk to us and give us their, their brief comments, 10 minutes or so, is that okay? Yeah. Um, and to, um, to, to discuss this, um, this aspect of, of history. First up, we have Professor Stein Runing, who is the founder of the Center for War Studies at SDU, uh, founded it in 2011. Yes, so we are, 2011, 2012, 10 years, yes. And headed it until 2019. He advised the commission of uh, the inquiry into the Danish decision to enter the wars in Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and the official review of Danish foreign policy between 2015 and 16. He served on the official Norwegian Afghanistan commission, and he is the former president of the Nordic International Studies Association and author of NATO in Afghanistan, the liberal Disconnect, published by Stanford University Press. So, Professor Runing, I will hand over to you. Your audience is here online and, of course, in front of you. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. Thank you, James, for inviting me. Thank you to DS staff for putting uh, this on, organizing it. Um, I now know why I do war studies, because my name turns out to be Stin Ruining. Uh, just a joke on the Eng English pronunciation there. Uh, no, thank you, James, for the kind introduction. <laughs> thank you. Um, it, it's, it's a hard act to follow when someone has personally experienced uh, this type of event. And I have researched it, and I have studied the war that followed in Afghanistan. Um, but here goes. Um, what, I, what I will uh, offer you are some reflections on um, why 20 years of war um, and development and governance efforts by the West turned out to be a failure. 
why was the West and its partners defeated in Afghanistan? I think that is the story. We understand via the testimony we heard why the war came about. Why did the ensuing war fail for all the efforts, for all the um, creative thinking that went into it? It failed. I will say a few things about what happened, then what really happened, and then what I think will happen. Um, three questions soon came to the forefront uh, once the war was on in Afghanistan, October 7th, 2001. Uh, and those were all questions related to architecture. What follows from the bombing? So the first question was, who will take ownership of the effort? Who will design the post-war peace? And the answer was that no one really knew and no one really thought that they had to carry or hold that baby. The answer became the Afghans themselves, uh, but they were not ready for the full uh, let's say, ownership of the, their own country. So part of the answer to, the, to the, the missing ownership is that the things happened very quickly in the fall. Uh, and the war began before there was even some coherent thinking on what will follow from the war. Um, and so in late November, early December, there's a UN-sponsored uh, conference to rebuild Afghanistan taking place in, in Germany. And, and from this, we gain a sense that, uh, or, or follows the conclusion that there will be an interim authority in Afghanistan. The Afghans themselves have decided how this is going to happen. And international society has offered to help. Security wise, by securing Kabul, the city. Otherwise, by being open to engagement. Um, from this, there was no real sense of who is in the driver's seat. And things didn't clarify when we went in 2000, 2002, uh, because things were divided out. Uh, it happened at a Tokyo donors conference in, in January 2002, when the Italians gained the justice uh, reform of Afghanistan, the, the Germans had to rebuild the police, uh, the British had to do counter narcotics, the Japanese uh, disarmament and dis demobilization, and the Americans had to rebuild the army. In other words, no one had full ownership of the campaign. The Afghans were supposed to have that. Meanwhile, the Afghans faced another question, which was, do we build Afghanistan on warlords, strong men, or do we build it on institutions? Now, obviously you would want to go for the institutions, but the reality was that Afghanistan had lots of low warlords and very few institutions. So you had to also be realistic. Where do you begin and how do you build? And the way the Afghans, they had designed a willingness to build institutions when they met in Germany. But by 2002, they were in Afghanistan and they were ready to build. And they held a first emergency loyal jirga, so a sort of constitutional assembly in mid 2002. And they invited all the warlords. And so this was hugely controversial, especially in the international donor community because they were not mostly not uh, ready to invest in warlords. They were more ready to invest in liberal institutions. So that changes once Afghanistan gains its const constitution and they elect a president and then a parla parliamentary assembly. The president is President Karzai. He puts together his first cabinet and there are no warlords. So. There's a shift, and so there's a sort of catering to the international community, which would 
have you think that the Afghans decided we're going to go for the institutions, not the warlords? But there is built into these new institutions, there are no political parties. They didn't organize political parties. They had an electoral system that were uh, vo- um, that consisted of electing individual politicians. And so that is an emphasis on people, and especially people with strong networks and strong resources. I don't need to remind you that warlords, they're, they're full of us. No parties, strong people. Um, no power sharing. The state was all about the president and the central government governing Afghanistan. The reasoning for this was um, that the Afghans didn't want to return to the 1990s. Civil war, Taliban rule, much cruelty. And then of course, that all led to new war. Um, But with the one hand, you emphasize strong people. On the other hand, you don't leave them much space for sharing in power. So you're building up a tension within the state. Where do the strong people go? And then finally, the institutional blueprint print didn't have any, what I would call a sunset clause or a, um, a horizon of constitutional review where you, uh, you know, you know, hindsight is 2020, but where you would say, you know, let's get 10 years in and then redo a constitutional assembly to see whether we got it right. Do we have the constitution that is fit for Afghanistan? They did not have that. So the the centralized, no power sharing, individualizing institutional blueprint that they came out of the early 2000s with, that was their roadmap. Those were... So there were lots of, I would say, suboptimal bad decision making in the early phase of the war. And uh, especially when you look at uh, the, the early, um, or when you look at Afghanistan history, you have to wonder how in the world do you end up with supporting the effort to build a central state in Afghanistan that centralizes power in a presidency that encourages individualized politics, but doesn't leave room for power sharing. Going by Afghan history, that's a pretty bad recipe. Because Afghanistan, and to cut a long story short, James, he invited me to speak for an hour and a half, but I I now realize I have 10 minutes. Um, To cut a long story short, Afghanistan has a strong society. And it has always, always had weak states because society was strong and it didn't allow a strong state. Many reasons for why it had a strong society. It was fragmented. There are the Hindu Kush mountains that fragments people. There there are different religious and ethnic traditions. It's fragmented, but with a very strong sense of local identity. And that doesn't easily get run by a central government. So central government, whenever Afghanistan has had it, has been on one of two conditions. Either a very strong external power that uh, subsidizes the central government. That was Britain for quite a while. And then it became the Soviet Union. And then it became the United States. Or it's a centralized government that is so brutal that society cannot resist. And that's the Taliban. Those are the two central states Afghanistan has known. In the early 2000s, they said, let's give it one more go, centralized state, and we'll pretend it will work out. Why in the world did we end up in that situation? There were the bad decisions I've described. You can always refer to the, you know, confusion at the moment. You know, we didn't know what we were doing. There were shocks, shock waves from 9-11. There was war. It's not easy. But what really happened, uh, you know, I think key to understand this is this dilemma between strong state uh, and, and, and confronting a strong society. And what we've seen here is that strong society won. 
Now, why did international society get into that? Um, I think uh, three, I offer you quickly three thoughts. Um, one is that um, this war happened in the wake of what I would call liberalism on steroids. That's the 1990s. It's uncontested, it's unipolar, it's the great era of globalization in the vein of liberalism. And it leads to a number of initiatives from responsibility to protect to the international uh, criminal court to the decision that, yes, we can when it comes to democratizing other countries. And that gets fused with a sense that, and if we need to, we can fight our way to a liberal peace. That's the neoconservative moment. There's a lot of this 90s, 1990s liberal, strong uh, moment that goes into the thinking of what is possible in Afghanistan. And once the international society set its mind on building Afghanistan, evidence was, yes, we can. So there, there was a critical compass, a sense that we need to think strategically about what we do when we go into other countries that was missing. And I think that's a trait in Western, the Western way of war it tends to be weak on strategy. It tends to be big on values, weak on strategy. And strategy, by strategy, I mean the ability to dial down on your political objective as you realize this is actually tough. We're not gonna be able to accomplish our initial goals. We need to dial down Instead, the, what the West did was it maintained the goal and it kept pouring in more resources and called it a surge. That was Obama, right? But it was not because you said the more the merrier that it became any more feasible. Um, and then I would add that the Afghanistan, Afghan leadership uh, was inept um, and it deteriorated over time. I think Karzai's last years as president were pretty pretty inept and of course there was a level of corruption that uh, that uh, disillusioned the afghan population but all of this comes back to the the uh, the uh, the decision to set up a strong state continue to invest in it and continue to believe in it all kinds of actors had all kinds of reasons for doing that and again, if, if you, you benefit from the corruption, there's your motive. If you benefit from it in terms of power, that's Karzai, there's your motive. If it makes you feel good, say some of our countries, there's your motive. But there are all kinds of motives for building up a strong state that wasn't feasible. And what we saw just some days ago was that it all came apart. And once the illusion became apparent, it rapidly came apart. So what happens next? I'll give you two takeaways. And then uh, I think, then, you know, I'll, I'll have to, uh, am I at seven minutes now? Okay. Um, two things. Uh, one, I, I see a sense that this is over. We lost. Let's look at the next challenge, China. And I think this is a very, very deeply politically driven uh, moment, especially in American politics. Um, I think it's overdone. And I think there's a risk that uh, the United States is repeating some of its same mistakes, namely reading too much of its own aspirations into a conflict and not gaining control of the conflict. I'm not denying that there's a conflict, I'm worried that they don't gain control of it. And I think that one of the drivers of uh, the way to deal with conflict is to focus on values. So this is Joe Biden, right? Uh, let's re-engage the, the, the democratic community. Let's build alliances, partnerships. It's, it's uh, dictatorships versus democracies. That is a great narrative and it's good politics perhaps but it's not a way to gain strategic control of a conflict. So if you get these values to drive your conflict with China, you're going to be in for one hell of a ride. The second thing I'll leave you with is, 
it ain't over in Afghanistan. Because going by Afghan history, the Taliban will not be able to rule gently. It will be brutal. And I, I put my money on a civil war. Maybe it will not be intense in the early phases. Maybe it will come and go. But I think there will be a lot of resistance to centralized Taliban rule. And in any case, the Taliban victory is a major, major victory for jihadism. It won. It's energized. It's a fantastic narrative if you want to recruit new adherents to your cause. And they are recruiting. They're open for business. So we can pretend we're leaving Afghanistan, but I don't think Afghanistan intends to leave us. And certainly not in the sense that Afghanistan will now become an issue for obviously Pakistan, but there's also India, Pakistan's rival, and there's Iran. And Iran is, uh, is uh, driving a lot of conflict with Western, Western countries in the Middle East region, and they just gained more fuel for doing so. Um, so there's been a lot of talk ever since Obama came to office that uh, let's leave the Middle East to focus on Asia. I don't think we can. And I just think we handed, we, you know, the, the big we handed the opponents of who we are uh, a great, great victory. And I think on both China and what the greater Middle Eastern region has to offer us, I think we need to be um, pretty cool headed about what we're heading into. I don't foresee great stability. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about what I think uh, will happen as, as the US and allies and partners adjust to this. But I think we're in for a, um, a bumpy ride. On that happy note, James. Thank you, Stan. Um, it's taken me three years to get your name that wrong, so my deepest apologies. And from now on, I think it's just going to be Steve. Um, Steve Rining, because I could just destroy it with my Britishness. My apologies. Um, next up, we have Professor Caroline Kennedy Pipe. The Guardian lists Caroline as one of the UK's leading scholars of war. And Caroline has worked on the Cold War, the Russian intervention in Afghanistan, IEDs, and the women of Afghanistan. And this has taken Caroline to Afghanistan on numerous occasions. She was a specialist advisor to the UK House of Commons Defence Select Committee and regularly advises governments and militaries on national security issues. Caroline sits on the Green Book of the Pakistani Army, is a member of the Makinda Forum and is a former chair of the British International Studies Association. And so without further ado, Caroline, I hand over to you. Um, thank you, James. Um, it's really good to be back here in Unza, if I'm saying that right. And it's an enormous privilege uh, to be a visiting fellow in Diaz. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be here. Um, Sten's a hard act to follow, as you all know, and he has said much of what I had scribbled down. And so I will try to pick out where we are similar and where we are different. Now, despite the chaos following the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and in the UK, we've lost over 450 of our service personnel and had numerous members of our armed services, both men and women, first time women were deployed into combat by the UK uh, to the IED. There is talk in the UK at the moment about whether we will have an official inquiry into the conduct of that war. And uh, the jury is still out on whether we want to repeat the Chilcot inquiry over Iraq, but it is hovering there precisely because of the chaotic rush to the exit. Now, despite the, the chaos over the last couple of weeks, I think there's an eerie symmetry um, to the end of the forever war. 
for the United States. We in the UK, of course, have fought much longer wars, uh, particularly in Northern Ireland and in other parts um, of our previous empire. But this 20 years is quite neat in dates. It's quite neat as an epoch and it's quite neat for historians. And it does seem to be ended with the supposed pivot to Asia by Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, and his drawing of a red line um, and the proclamation of America first. I should also add, I've just been at a conference in Estonia where European diplomats and ambassadors were present, all raging against Biden's rush to the exit. But we did have advance notice of what would happen. It was quite clear after Trump, President Trump concluded the Doha agreement that the Americans would be gone. And I should note that the French, of course, had already started withdrawing its people and its assets in the spring, and that we were really rather tardy in, in leaving, knowing that the Americans would go. I think we all believed that there would be some kind of extension um, to, to that, and we were wrong. So is this a neat end, at least historically, 20 years after 9-11 and to our entrance into that war? Now, I'm not so sure. I don't think it's an end point. I think that the long lines of history, as Sten said, still infect and inform what is happening in Afghanistan. So I'm not so sure that this is a new beginning as a continu continuation of much longer themes. Now, those of you who know my work know that I've always argued that 9-11 wasn't a new beginning. I saw 9-11 as actually bookending the real end of the Cold War and much of the politics of the high Cold War. And I think you'll know that I argue that actually the important feature of the Cold War, the most important turning point was the Iranian revolution of 1979. What the Iranian revolution of 1979 did was create a theocracy, kick the Americans out and the Shah out of power and inspire the Soviet Union as it then was under Brezhnev to invade Afghanistan into its very own bleeding wound as Gorbachev phrased it, into its own Vietnam. And that war ended, as we know, um, in a withdrawal by the Soviet Union, the unraveling of the Soviet Union itself. And of course, that long period of the 1990s, where Sten quite rightly said, we in the West were overcome with the liberal impulse of intervention, responsibility to protect. But in Afghanistan, we saw a violent, civil war, we saw a return of Taliban, and of course we saw the hosting by Taliban of Osama bin Laden. And I note today, looking at the new government arrangements in Afghanistan, that the Taliban have done a deal, not just with Al-Qaeda, but the Haqqani network. Not a single woman now in that provisional government, but a ragtag of radical jihadi militants. And remember the leader of the Haqqani network is one of America's most wanted men. And he's now the Minister of the Interior. Make of that what you will. But when we look at Afghanistan, that civil war that brought the Taliban back to power, the events of 9-11 hatched in Afghanistan by Osama bin Laden, who for years had wandered after being expelled from Saudi Arabia, who had fought the Russians in the Afghan war, who had provided money and wherewithal through Pakistan, to which I will return, into the Mujahideen, the holy warriors who had fought and defeated the Soviet army. Osama bin Laden was in the pay of the CIA for much of that period. Think of blowback. And after the defeat of the superpower, the Soviet Union, the Americans dumped us out from Bin Laden. He could not go back to his own country, even though he wanted to go back to Saudi Arabia and help fight the Gulf War against the infidels. And after a period in Sudan, he ends up as a guest of Taliban. 9-11 is hatched out of Taliban. 
And Joe Biden, remember, only this week has gone on record to say that the war in Afghanistan wasn't a total failure because in the period when we, stands we, were in Afghanistan, not a single plot was hatched on the West from the soil of Afghanistan. I don't think we can say that will happen in the future. I have no confidence in that. So the intriguing thing for me, the war in Afghanistan ended in negotiation. We were talking to Taliban for years, to the warlords, to those, and we have the hope now that Taliban 2021 is not old Taliban. We'll see. We also believe, and I think Sven's entirely right, it will become a rallying call, call for jihadists, having beaten the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, now beaten the United States in Afghanistan. That's a very, very powerful message for any of the angry, dispossessed around the globe. And remember how young the population of Afghanistan actually is in terms of a new generation, perhaps being recruited to that particular cause. We also in the UK have the view that some of our enemies, and we have a very fractious relationship with Russia at the moment, will also feel emboldened and empowered by this defeat. I don't take that view, and I've just written a briefing paper. I think Russia um, will not want Afghanistan to fall apart for a number of reasons. And the first is that sitting in Central Asia, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan are all worried about spillover from Afghanistan. Borders, migrants, and drugs. And Russia does not feel powerful enough to engage militarily in terms of those politics. So I take a bit different view of Putin's Russia, mischievous, mischief making though it is, certainly in terms of the UK. I think Russian expansionism will be encouraged, but it won't be down in Afghanistan. But the Estonians are very worried about Article 5. Would Joe Biden really stand by Article 5 if there is a Russian attack on an Estonia? So that's the first question. Second, Pakistan. The donors are not happy that Pakistan will have to be brought into the mix in terms of the future control of Afghanistan. Pakistan is, in my view, an army with a state attached. It is a failing state, it is a fragile state, and it is a meddling state in terms of Afghanistan. And the Pakistanis, of course, with American money through the ISA, have betrayed the Americans on numerous occasions, not least with that very odd tale of how Osama bin Laden survived so long in Pakistan, down the road from the main military academy, with the Americans not knowing. Big question over the future of Pakistan. And here, the leverage will have to come from China. China does have ambitions in Afghanistan, Belt and Road, trillions of dollars of raw and rare materials. But China will not open its checkbook until it has a guarantee from Pakistan that the country will be stable and that Pakistan will work towards that ambition. The problem with Pakistan, though, and remember that only four countries have embassies open in Kabul at the moment, is India. India has been approached by Taliban. India has been a major donor to the building of roads and dams. Even the parliament building in Kabul is Indian money. The Indians and the Pakistanis um, will fight each other diplomatically and strategically over the future of the country. But I've just heard that the Indians will be opening an, an embassy in Kabul very, very shortly. So, we have a new great game. We do have a new great game in the country and stands entirely right, Iran too will be a very powerful player. Iran, of course, with its theocratic system also wants the stabilization of Afghanistan because it doesn't want a repeat of the 1990s refugee crisis, which it suffered last time Taliban came to power. And what an extraordinary thing to say last time Taliban came to power, uh, a permanent feature of the politics. 
so we're back. And the UK will, I think, with the United States, have to meddle in the forthcoming civil war. I think you're entirely right. Then it's going to be who supplies whom. Now, the, the rebels who were holding out until yesterday, just up the road from Kabul, ran out of ammunition and arms. They were supplied by the Tajiks for a while. So the game will probably be a covert shadow game about influencing the forthcoming civil war with powerful players in it. And that, I think to follow up, and I only have a few minutes left, I'll be on time, um, is how did we get it wrong and what mistakes were made? So the first I would agree absolutely with Stern. The big problem was that that immediate triggering of Article 5 for NATO and for the American allies was about revenge um, and it was about taking Taliban down. It then morphed into nation building, which was never an, ori um, an original strategic aim. So the mission changed. But the crucial mistake in my book that was made is the two war strategy. Iraq 2003 had nothing to do with Afghanistan and it diverted attention away from what should have been happening in Afghanistan. The lesson has been learned, not two major wars at one time. And then I think there's a much broader problem here, which is, I think, stands entirely right. We've been misled by tactics and liberal interventionism rather than by grand strategy. And that liberal impulse coming out of the 1990s meant that we genuinely began to believe we could nation build in Afghanistan and in Iraq without thinking through the consequences of that. I think there's another problem for the Europeans, which has opened up a big gap with the United States, and it is a gap. In Europe, I think we've spent the post-1945 period creating the mechanisms, the institutions to avoid war, not to wage war again on the catastrophic level of World War I and World War II. So we tend to believe that we can construct frameworks to prohibit war. And we have been successful uh, in, in Europe. The problem is the Americans don't share that core set of values about institutions and about war. And so certainly in the UK at the moment, we're debating, and how ironic is this, just having lived through Brexit, should we be moving closer back again to European allies like France? And we're a full spectrum, independent, nuclear power, a member of the UN Security Council. And despite the financial crisis over COVID, our current Prime Minister Boris Johnson has made the biggest investment in defence that we've seen for 30 years. And the debate now is what will we be investing in? Will we follow, as we seem to indicate last year, the tilt to Asia? Or will we return to our core backyard, as we term it, North Europe, the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, dealing with Russia, which is our number one foe? So for the UK, the drawdown has been extremely painful in terms of the shedding of blood and treasure. Although I do note, James made the point earlier, the Danes in Afghanistan took the highest losses per um, size of force deployed, raises a whole host of questions. But for us in the UK, after 20 years of commitment to Afghanistan and our history in Afghanistan, we think we'll be back. It might take a while. But one of the features which we can discuss in questions is in the last two years and during the negotiations in Doha, the Americans had more service personnel in the UK than they did in Afghanistan. With the contractors with the air power, there was a form of stability in Afghanistan. The Afghan army did not collapse like a house of cards until their logistics and air power were pulled away from them. This idea that the Afghan army did not fight is quite wrong because they've been leading since 2014 and they, have, they took over 64,000 casualties. The problem was no modern army can fight without contractors, logistics and air power. I think there will be a civil war, but I think 
that the West, we, will be back in Afghanistan within five years because Afghanistan is too important to be left. Quick one as well on the women of Afghanistan. Um, obviously, we're all very, very fearful after 20 years of so-called emancipation, which, of course, was mainly herbal, not necessarily rural. But as everybody uh, is hand-wringing in the UK about our losses, there were gains. And I'm not going to talk about no terrorist attacks. Uh, infant mortality dropped by 50% in the time that um, we were in Afghanistan. A generation of girls were educated. And there were some small, I grant you, uh, emancipatory and liberal practices. Registration of weddings, registrations of uh, the birth of girls, fewer forced marriages, even though one in 15 girls will die in childbirth before she is 16. But there were some signs. So when we look at Afghanistan before we, you know, tear up the script and, you know, designate it as a complete failure, I think the failure will be what we do next and if we do nothing next. So I'll stop there. Thank you both so much. Um, as you all gather your questions, and um, I don't know if we have some online as well, I, I certainly have a couple, perfect. Um, you both, this is one that's just come to, off the top of my head, actually. You both spoke about the idea of, of this leading into a, a civil war. And we know that one of the signs of most, if not all, civil wars is that there'll be nation states behind each side. And so I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about which nation states will continue to be involved in both sides of the conflict if this conflict does start to go into a raging civil war and become hot once again. I don't know if who wanted to address that first. You can take the stand. Potentially, but it may reverberate. I can speak up. I can speak loudly. And, uh, um, so it, it's a good question, but quite obviously, the winner in this conflict is Pakistan. They have lied and they have deceived. Carolyn is entirely right. And they will continue to invest and safeguard their uh, big price is they now control Afghanistan via the Taliban. They don't control it directly. The Taliban has hurt Pakistan as well. Uh, Pakistan is not united. But at the end of the day, the core of the Pakistani state has invested in the Taliban. They, to a great extent, control a great deal of the movement and they won. They will continue to feed into this civil war conflict without end. India will be present because all of this is about India and Pakistan and Iran too, because Iran cannot protect its own society in a, in a way Iran is vulnerable to events in Afghanistan because the, the drug economy is hurting Iran. Iran is also protecting the Shi'i minorities of Afghanistan. And um, and uh, then uh, you know then there then there are the Central Asian states. But I think most importantly, what the new player in this will be China, and China will want to stabilize, and they will want to do it via Pakistan. And so, so here's the question: China and Iran are allied on events in the Middle East. In fact. Iran has signed on with a strategic agreement with China that to a very great extent uh, matches the, the uh, what, what's the name, the, the treaties, the unequal treaties that China always complain about. Iran now has it. But, uh, um, God, I was speaking too much. I always forgot my own point. Um, but, um, so China is with Iran, uh, but China is also with Pakistan. And it, if Pakistan and Iran comes into conflict, how are they going to balance this? 
And I think this is the, will be the one to watch. And I, I, I presume that China will do everything, as Caroline said, to stabilize, calm. They want order, but I don't think they're gonna they're going to have it. That will be a uh, an interesting test for a rising superpower as well about how it balances its allies. So one to watch. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Caroline. No. Okay. I'm going to open for questions from the floor. Do we have any here in the audience? Yes, please go ahead. Um, one of the things I noticed that someone used in your prediction is that we're coming back within five years, and Steve, yours was that the government will be able to win the power. And I think I want to ask Steve, do you think there's a difference in the amount of the ammunition that the United States still can use? So the question here is whether or not the amount of ammunition that the United States has left behind for the Taliban will make a difference in, in how the war plays out. Mm, it has the potential to intensify things. Um, but I think the real driver is the, is the economy and the, the drug economy and who gets to control it and who gets to control the smuggling economy the the smuggling out of Afghanistan of every natural resource they have, whether it's agriculture or timber or minerals, all of that richness, it's not very rich, but all of those riches will not come to benefit the Afghan people. And they, they will, uh, so who gets to control the economy? That will be the driver of the conflict. And the warlords who are now armed will fight intensely. Uh, you know, and by warlords, I mean uh, both those who are allied into the Taliban movement uh, and uh, that tend to to have to to obey command and control, but also those who resist. And it will be very. There will be lots of. Uh, so we tend to see this as a Taliban versus the warlords, but there will be lots of overlaps and local deals in this, lots and lots. And uh, and I think. Caroline, what is your view on this? But I think the, the economy would be the driver. So thank you. That's an excellent question. And um, I think that we were all shocked when we saw the amount of equipment that the Americans in particular have, have left behind, which has tactically proved decisive at this point against the rebels. And it's one of the reasons why airstrikes have been taking place, precisely to try and degrade um, the equipment that is left. But we've been here before. We never seem to learn these lessons. So, you know, Stinger missiles from the Soviet war in Afghanistan are still being sold. Um, so we tend to think, as Sten said, short term, that that equipment should have been destroyed. But of course, I've been told that the Americans would not do that because it would have signaled um, well in advance that the pullout was happening. But equipment, you're absolutely right, and tactical. Now, I mean, the, the technical question, and James might know this better, as he's a, a technology expert, I don't know how long Taliban can go on running the helicopters without technicians. Um, and so it's short term at the moment. But of course, the Tajiks, as I mentioned, are already putting arms in. Uh, the rebels have retreated to the hills. It's whether another actor chooses to come in um, into this game. Russia, I think at the moment, we've got Michael here, who's an expert on that. Russia's more interested in Belarus at the moment and, uh, and the pressure there and what is happening in Belarus. But will there be a return to Afghanistan? I think a lot will hinge on Putin's relationship with what we call the stands. You know, what's going to happen and what pressure will they put on the Russians? But thank you. Thank you both. I'm going to turn to a couple of our online questions and thank you for so many of you just for tuning in. We've had uh, 90 people overall, which is uh, fantastic. And uh, thank you for joining the Danish Institute for Advanced Study. Yes, <laughs> all of your family. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Um, <laughs> um, we've had a question that says, um, and you mentioned this actually, Caroline, in passing. Joe Dittmar spoke about Denmark and European nations being loyal allies of the US. Does this rapid and confusing withdrawal count as a betrayal, a strong word, to that loyalty, that loyalty over 20 years? And what does it mean for guarantees of support in the future? I'll let you approach that first, Caroline, and maybe you have something to add to them. Yeah, 
So there is absolutely no doubt that we were taken aback by the speed. There is absolutely no doubt in the UK, despite um, knowing that that deadline was coming, um, we were really rather shocked because phone calls had not been made. Um, I know all the jokes about to our foreign secretary who was on holiday, but the calls were not even made. And so that has caused some bitterness. But there is also a pragmatic realism in the UK that without the United States, we wouldn't be able to operate. Um, you know, European defence rests through NATO on US leadership. So we're pragmatic if dismayed. Um, and I do know that the PM has been speaking, speaking more to his counterparts in France, and as has the MOD. But we're entirely pragmatic that betrayal is too strong a word, but mistake would be better. I'm just going to butt in really quickly because I think I can augment this perhaps a little bit more towards um, your research area, and we've both wrote on this, written on this. Do you think that this means at this point in time that Europe needs to think seriously, more seriously than it ever has, about trying to consider a European army at some point forwards, or is that impossible? I think without question, there is one overwhelming lesson of the of the uh, defeat and the disorderly retreat from Afghanistan, it's that NATO and the transatlantic partnership needs to be rebalanced. And Europe will have to do a lot more to take care of its own defense within its own region. It still cannot do that without the United States. So the rebalancing will have to be part of a new transatlantic deal. Without the United States, we are like the Afghans. Uh, no contractors, no logistics, no enablers. We're not going to survive into a war with Russia for long. So we're going to have to cater to the American partnership, but we're, have gonna have, we're going to have to bring more to it. And when I look at this country, I don't see any debate on raised defense budgets. I don't see any debates on canceling our defense opt-out in the EU, and I don't see any debates on uh, teaming up with the other big European countries to make a difference in military terms, not security terms, not conflict resolution, not resiliency in North Africa type, uh, you know, broad politics, military terms. It's not happening. And for long as that doesn't happen, there will be no European army. And so the, the best thing we can hope for, if you're in the business of hope, is a rebalanced transatlantic partnership. The other scenarios, I, I don't think we want to think too much about those. It's then quite the, uh, quite the food for thoughts there. Do you have any more questions from our audience? Yes, Marie, go ahead. I know the border is competing with Russian at the moment, but I was just wondering, wondering like, what is the relationship with the West to the region, and also between Russia and the Soviet Union, and Russia generally, geographically, Russia is such a different in the story. Great question. Thank you. Who would like to take that one? Don't rush all at once. No, no. So it's very interesting because. Um, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, part of after the Soviet leadership under Gorbachev had accepted the breakdown um, in the Soviet Union, immense efforts were made to kind of transform the political elite from communist just to pro-Moscow uh, across uh, Central Asia. And um, the Tajiks, along with the Uzbeks, do have a lot of um, terrible phrase skin in the game because, of course, part of the Haqqani network is Tajik. And so one of the interesting questions for me envisaging a civil war, and Sten talked quite rightly about a strong society, but the different ethnic groups within Afghanistan will go to their powerful allies and partners. Iran has already given guarantees uh, to the Shias. So 
what we'll see is um, if Russia wants to meddle, I would go through the Central Asian states. That, that's what I would do. But they have an interest precisely because of the border area, but also the historic relationship with their people. Now, the, the problem is for um, the Central Asian states, they don't want a rush into their own countries and they don't want to be overwhelmed. So many have closed the borders for now and would rather fun funnel money in. But as I said, if Moscow is going to be involved, it will come through the Central Asian states. Thank you, Caroline. An excellent answer to a, a difficult question and um, one I didn't have the answer to. So thank you for teaching us a thing or two there. As ever, yes, absolutely. Um, do we have any other questions from the floor? No. Oh, yes, Michael, please go ahead. Uh, my understanding is that China's very reluctant about sending military forces into conflict with the North Africa. So, will they be going to the St. Hubert's route and be involved in? What is your perspective on that? So it's a really good question and actually mirrors a question that we've been asked online as well about whether or not China, Russia, India, if they do step in, have the will and the resources to take on that fight. I think as Sven indicated, China will lean on Pakistan. If you look at Chinese soft power, it's far more effective and preferable for them. If we look at the Arctic where China is gobbling up space, it's not military. There is absolutely no sign, for example, of military activity in the Arctic. It will be done through third parties and it will be done on the usual checkbook, checkbook diplomacy. So the key hope is that China will lean very heavily on Pakistan not to fuel the flames. Um, but, it, but you're right, it won't be military. This draws us into our final five minutes and our final question. Um, the question comes from online. It says, Stain explained what went wrong, but I'd be interested to know his thoughts on whether there was any alternative policy choices available to the US slash coalition in Afghanistan that could have avoided the withdrawal in 2021. And if not, when did that door close? Um, so um, I think my my research has led me to to identify some things that should have been dealt with differently. But I have not. I, I I've, I've deliberately refrained from drawing the conclusion that I thus know what would have worked, and. Uh, in, in, a, in a conflict situation, when when uh, when there's an armed conflict, and uh, if, you know you're having a political development within a context of war, you have to be very careful with uh, pretending that you can actually control this. What you what you want to um, cultivate is your ability to think it through and to manage the politics of it. And I don't think we've been very good at that. But to get to the question, um, I indicated one, one uh, key moment was when uh, the Afghans came up with a centralized state blueprint. That should have been questioned, the durability of it. Can you run with this type of state in Afghanistan without sharing power? And I think that there are then numerous occasions where you can ask these questions. Um, and I think Caroline is exactly right when she invokes the Iraq war, 2003, and the surge in the Iraq war, which consumes all the oxygen in, in the United States, takes place in six, seven, eight. And it's really only on the backside of that war that we get to Afghanistan again. And by then it's pretty late. And, and, um, and uh, remarkably, um, Obama struggled with this question. He wanted to dial down the ambition, the level of ambition, but it, he ended up dialing it up. We can, we can talk about the ironies here, but one of the things that struck me uh, uh, when I did research on this was the civil military relationship was not good in the United States under Obama. McChrystal, uh, the, the savior in Afghanistan, General McChrystal, 
ended up being fired because he was, uh, you know, speaking, his, his, his staff around him was speaking brazenly about uh, Joe Biden. And, and, uh, and there's something there that we need to pay attention to. Because if you fight long wars that are exhausting politically and that, in a way, empower the military because they hold the tools for policy, you get civil military tension. And this is where your ability to conduct strategy and have a strategic dialogue within your own security apparatus becomes really, really important. If you don't manage that dialogue and you don't manage your level of ambition, you're setting yourself up for a type of failure. And we ended up with a big one. So in answer to the question, I would say, look at the nature of the Afghan state. Why wasn't it questioned? Look at the ability of Western countries to address their own level of ambition and look at what happened to civil military relations uh, also in this country and other countries. They are not in a good state of affairs and that's all a fallout from uh, 20 years of uh, exhausting war. Um, just to say, um, of course I agree that um, if we look at the two war strategy, it was exhausting for the Obama administration. And he's, you know, a president both times, both administrations at war. And yet his earlier hope was to, to get out of Iraq, whatever it costs, the losses in blood and trade, and make Afghanistan a success. And the key question is why he couldn't do that. And he did have a fractured relationship with the military. They didn't trust him. They didn't like his liberalism. They're quite clear about that. They preferred Bush um, in many, many ways. So. Was there a crisis of confidence in the Obama administration? And then again, looking at James's work, they really didn't want to do the war properly. Um, they didn't see uh, the texture of the country, uh, the texture of the people. And then it became about controlling a remote war, not taking the sacrifices, using war at a distance, standoff weaponry. And that doesn't work in a place like Afghanistan. And for me, you know, once we started talking about this imaginary place, AFPAC, wherever that is, to signify that there's a different constellation, I think we'd already lost because we didn't know the people and we didn't know the place. And I think that that was a huge mistake. Well, it has been an informative, educational, and I think at times emotional couple of ours. But thank you all for joining us at home in this hybrid event, which hopefully has worked well, although we'll work out some of the kinks next time. And thank you all for joining us in person. We have another Diaz event coming up on the 23rd of September at 2pm with the Danish Arctic ambassador, Thomas Winkler, which will be in this hall and you are all invited and it will be live streamed as well. So pop subscribe on the DS YouTube page and, page and you'll get announcements about that. But uh, this just leaves me on time, on the hour, for you all to thank our guest speakers today. Thank you. There is wine and refreshments outside of the doors here to your left hand side. Please help yourselves. Oh, I'm sorry. Nice.